The American Society of Magical Negroes is a race baiting movie about how supposedly dangerous white people in America are. What's the most dangerous animal on the planet? Sharks. White people. Oh. When are white people most dangerous? When they're teamed up with sharks. When they feel uncomfortable. When the trailer was first released on YouTube, it was immediately met with backlash from people of all ethnicities and it currently has over 124,000 dislikes. But who would make a movie like this in the first place and why? Well, this movie was written, directed, and produced by Kobe Libby, a biracial man raised by his white mother and is married to a white woman. The irony, I watched the entire movie all one hour and 44 minutes of it and I have thoughts. Hello everyone, if you're a new viewer, welcome. If you're a returning viewer, welcome back. If this is your second, third, fourth time watching one of my videos and you are not yet subscribed, we already go together. Okay, make it official and hit that subscribe button. So you saw the intro, you know what I'm gonna be talking about today. The awful movie, The American Society of Magical Negroes. In a previous video, I said that The Marvels is probably one of the most pointless movies ever made. And I stand corrected. This is one of the most pointless and most awful movies ever made. I watched this movie with my boyfriend. I told him that I wanted to review it. So he got us tickets and I swear to you, there were only eight people, including us, in the theater. This movie is not going to last in theaters very long and it's not going to make a profit. This movie was so awful, I contemplated leaving 30 minutes into it and going to watch Kung Fu Panda, but I stuck it out for you guys, but I felt ripped off. I wanted to get our money's worth, so afterwards, <laughs> When the movie was done, we snuck into the movie Imaginary, which I recommend if you like thrillers or scary movies, but also if you like getting your money's worth, I recommend Aura, who is sponsoring this video and offering all of my viewers a no-obligation 14-day free trial, and trust me, you need it, I needed it. Have you ever Googled your name to see what shows up? I was so afraid to do it, but I did it, and I was horrified. Here I was thinking I'm living my life in incognito mode, and I wasn't. Did you know that data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you? Your full name, email address, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all out there. And that is exactly why you need Aura. Aura shows you which data brokers are selling your information and automatically submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Cleaning up your information will not only help reduce the amount of spam you get, but it protects you from hackers who could use this information to access your social media accounts, bank accounts, or other sensitive information. If any of your own personal accounts have been hacked, your information could be out there on the digital black market and Aura could help you get that removed. And the best thing about Aura is that it is a one-stop shop for all of your privacy needs. With your Aura subscription, you also get other features like identity theft insurance, antivirus protection, a VPN, password management, parental controls, and more without having to download several different apps. And you get everything at one affordable price. I know some of you may have one or two of these tools already, but not having Aura is like locking the front door but leaving the back door open. If you want to be fully secured, you have to cover all of your bases. I value my privacy and I value yours, so I highly recommend you give Aura a try. To start your 14-day free trial today, click my link aura.com slash nissisocial in the description box below. I would like to give a special thanks to Aura for sponsoring this video. So like I mentioned earlier, I watched the American Society of Magical Negroes and I have thoughts. The premise of the movie centers around Aaron, who is mixed race, is a struggling artist, and who feels that being black in America is awful. One night, after leaving his art showcase, he stops by an ATM machine where he encounters a drunk white girl. The girl asks him to hold her purse, which he does, and during this interaction, he ends up being accused of stealing from her by two white men, one of them being the girl's boyfriend. Before things can escalate, Roger, played by David Allen Greer, uses his magic to fix the situation and makes the white 
white people comfortable. Roger had been following Aaron to recruit Aaron into the Society of Magical Negroes, but Aaron isn't very interested in joining. However, Roger pretty much forces Aaron to be a part of it. The Society's one and only reason for existing is to make white people comfortable, because when white people are uncomfortable, they do bad things to black people. Their words, not mine. White people move into a neighborhood, they feel uncomfortable, gentrification. But I don't blame white people for that. I blame their discomfort. That's why we here at the American Society of Magical Negroes fight white discomfort every damn day. This is insane, you fool! Once Aaron is a part of the society, he reluctantly embraces his responsibilities. Shortly after joining the society, he heads to a coffee shop where he meets a white woman named Lizzie and is immediately smitten with her. During this encounter with Lizzie in the coffee shop, he gets a call from Roger with his first assignment and only assignment that he gets in the movie, which is to cheer up Jason. Jason works for a social media company called Meatbox. It's supposed to be a spoof a Facebook, I guess. I mean, it's not a very clever joke. This is not funny! It's not funny! But anyways, Jason is stressed out because he worked on a project to bring facial recognition to Meatbox, but the facial recognition was unable to recognize black faces, and now the company is being accused of racism. So... Jason is stressed about that. Through the power of black boy magic, Aaron becomes an employee at Meatbox and pursues a friendship with Jason in order to make Jason feel better about his competencies and importance at Meatbox. But something that no one could have ever predicted happens. Lizzie, the white woman from the coffee shop who Aaron has a crush on after knowing her for all of 90 seconds, also works at Meatbox. And even more shockingly, in a twist that no one could have ever seen coming, Jason also has a crush on Lizzie. <gasps> oh, Colby Libby is so clever, a modern day Shakespeare. Round of applause, who could have ever written a more clever plot? I didn't see any of this coming. I was in the theater, clutching my pearls, in shock. I was so surprised. This movie was just full of twists and turns. You don't have to be a sarcastic bitch about it, okay? This movie was so <laughs> cheesy, holy <laughs> And I also forgot to mention that once you're a member of the Society of Magical Negroes, you have to always do what's in the best of all black people, and that means putting white people first. If you step out of line and make a white person uncomfortable, upset, or undermine them in any way, then all of the magical Negroes lose their power and become regular black people. So if Aaron pursues Lizzie, he would be going against the society because his job is to make Jason happy and Jason is interested in dating Lizzie. Throughout the movie, Aaron struggles with this. He tries to set Jason and Lizzie up and Lizzie seems open to getting to know Jason on a more intimate level. But over time, Aaron's feelings for Lizzie grow and Lizzie begins to reciprocate feelings for Aaron. Towards the end of the movie, Aaron tells Lizzie he just wants to be friends and she is confused but agrees. Aaron then learns from Jason that Jason plans to ask Lizzie on a date after his big presentation for Meatbox shareholders. Aaron then decides he can't let that happen. He interrupts Jason's presentation to tell him that he's a bad friend, he's not an ally, and he goes on a long cliche speech about how being a black man in America is hard because he feels unseen and unsafe and the speech is so cringe and it goes on forever and I was just watching it like 15 more minutes, 15 more minutes and then I can leave. What is this? Sit down. You know what? We're not going to die of radon. We're going to die of boredom. <laughs> Aaron then walks off stage where he encounters Lizzie. They share romantic moments. He uses his black boy magic to teleport them to the top of the Empire State Building. They have a moment and he's about to kiss Lizzie when he gets teleported to the... <laughs> to the headquarters for the Society of Magical Negroes, where the Negroes have lost all of their magic as a result of Aaron's actions. He then gets kicked out of the Society of Magical Negroes because he failed at his mission to make Jason more comfortable and because he didn't do what was best for the collective. Aaron accepts his fate and pursues a relationship with Lizzie. The end. They stretch that simple plot out for one hour and 44 minutes. That can't be legal. The only thing more offensive than the premise of the movie is how genuinely boring it is. Jordan Peele does movies with social commentary on race relations in America, and I feel like Colby Libby was trying to be a Jordan Peele, but he failed miserably. At times, it felt like they didn't even have a script. They just had an outline of what they needed to say, and they were left to improvise, and the improvisation was terrible. 
they would literally be like, so um, Lizzie, Lizzie's great, right? You like Lizzie? Yeah, yeah, Lizzie, Lizzie, Lizzie's awesome. Um, Lizzie's my work wife and I, you know, I have to say she makes working here so, so great. She, she really does. Yeah, so um, have you ever thought about, you know, asking, asking Lizzie on a date? Oh, you know what? I thought about it and I'm like, you know, maybe I shouldn't, maybe, I, I don't know, do you, do you think I should? Well, I mean, if you like her, you should, you should ask her on a date. You know, you know what? You're, you're right. I should ask Lizzie on a date. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah. The dialogue was so awful. It had to have been improvised because it makes no sense how someone could write so many like um yas into a script. And can I just say that for a movie called The Society of Magical Negroes, the main character didn't really do magic very often in the movie. Once he becomes a member of the, the society, he actually only uses magic twice. I felt ripped off. I was prepared to see a black Harry Potter and this movie was so boring. And Aaron, the main character, is very clearly a self-insert of Kobe Libby. As I mentioned earlier, Kobe Libby is the writer, director, and producer of this movie and the actor who plays Aaron looks exactly like him. He even has the same personality as Kobe. Boring and uncharismatic. We start at the so-called Daily Beast, which misquoted us. We said Alex Jones is a raging bull, virile, masculine, feral. But they said Jones is a raging bowl, B-O-W-L. And you might think it's just a typo, but the Beast hyperlinked to a picture of a bowl. Oh my God, corny, <laughs> lame bowl. Tomato, 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 I'm throwing tomatoes. The love interest, Lizzie, is clearly a representation of Colby's wife, Elizabeth. My own personal interpretation is that this is a movie about how Colby feels at odds with his blackness, the character was reluctant to join the Society of Magical Negroes, but was forced into it. And as soon as he falls in love with a white woman, he betrays the black people to be with her. I, I sincerely don't know who the target audience is for this movie. If he was trying to target a very radical pro-black audience, he failed to do so because the plot of this movie is literally the opposite of what a radical pro-black audience would want to see. If he's trying to target a white audience, well, he offended them by painting them all as dangerous and so fragile that they need to be treated like children. I'm not sure what he was trying to do with this movie and obviously he didn't know either. What are some of the strong visual, oral, uh, tonal elements that you were thinking about when conceiving the screenplay? What, what are you thinking out in, a, in your, your dreamscape palette, let's say? Uh, well, one of the things that I think is exciting about this piece is I don't have a great tonal comp for it. Hmm. That's an interesting way of putting... That makes sense. At this point, most people are tired of Hollywood using media to create even more racial division, and it shows in the comments people are leaving online about this movie. White people and black people are coming together to let you know this movie is not it at all. Nice to see somebody confront the magical Negro trope, but this doesn't seem like the right way to go about it. We're trading one trope for another here, and it's weird. I can't tell if this movie is supposed to just discourage a whole group of people from seeing it, or if it's supposed to bring us all together. I don't feel the second part. So the general consensus from the average person is that they don't F with this movie. And typically a movie like this will get critics who support it, even though it sucks, just because most critics are more focused on ideology rather than giving an unbiased opinion. But the critics don't like it either. It lacks form, edge politics coherency, and the grand vision necessary for vast world building. It's a film that begins on volatile ground only to tumble down a tonally rocky hill before settling on a conclusion so emotionally dissonant that its clang rings louder than the minor laughs the film engenders during its bloated runtime. So that's a really fancy way of saying the movie was shit. American society can't decide whether to go full biting satire or charming rom-com. And as a result, it fails to do either genre justice. A socially conscious romantic comedy, and if those two modes don't sound compatible, 
Libby does nothing to alter that impression. This movie should have never gotten a theatrical release. It belongs on Tubi. Actually, let me not disrespect Tubi like that. There's some good stuff on there. <laughs> this movie has no place in civilized society. We don't live in a perfect world, but we have come much further than movies like this give credit for. And there is something very oxymoronic about a biracial man who was raised by a white mother, marries a white woman, and regularly chooses to work with white people, making an anti-white movie. If he's so afraid of white people and feels so invalidated by them, why did he marry one? Why is he one? <laughs> Kobe Libby is trying to build a movie career off of woke ideology and it's a losing formula. People want to be entertained, not lectured to. And if you're going to lecture your audience, then you should at least know who your audience is. Anyways, those are my thoughts on this movie. I doubt any of you watched it. Um, if you haven't, I don't suggest that you do because it would be a colossal waste of time. And if you have already watched it, my condolences for the time that you have lost that you will never get back. I would also like to thank Aura for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to check out the description box below for the link to start your 14-day free trial if you value your online privacy. Aura is a great and affordable product to keep your identity safe. If you liked this video, please don't forget to hit the like button. If you're not yet subscribed, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. If you liked this video and you would like to see two more like it, I will have two more videos linked for you in the end cards. I will see you guys in the next one. Take care. Bye.